You are listening to FFL Radio Radio. You're listening to the Owner's Box Podcast on SFL Radio. Now here's the host of the SOP and my bongo playing compadre, Stephen Mullinax. All right, all right, all right. Welcome to the SFL Owner's Box. The SOB is a weekly 30-minute podcast that covers all the headline-worthy topics from this week in the Simulation Football League, a.k.a. the SFL. For the uninitiated, the SFL is the ultimate sim football experience that features real-life users as players, coaches, and owners. Other features include a live commentated SFL Red Zone where you can watch five games at once with in-depth pre-game and post-game shows live on YouTube. There's also a Game of the Week shown in its entirety with a live two-man commentary crew, full stat tracking provided by Dak Stats, fantasy football, and much, much more. Find out how you can get involved at simulationfl.com. That's simulationfl.com. On today's show, I give my list of the five most intriguing team builds going into the new season, and I have a great one-on-one interview with the owner of the Carolina Skyhawks, Mr. James Klein. James and I discuss his current team build, the thought process behind swapping his coordinators in the offseason, and if Johnny English is still the SFL's top running back. That and much, much more. But first, let's talk about my list of the most intriguing team builds in a segment we call The Rundown. The Prime Minister of Sweden visited Washington today, and my tiny little nipples went to France. What did he just say? With the winter 2017 season launching in less than a week, I wanted to go over my list of the five most intriguing team builds in the SFL this season. First, let me say this is the most intriguing list. That doesn't mean these are the teams that are my favorites to to lead or, or win the league this season. It simply means I'm intrigued as a team owner, coach, and or fan of the league by these five team builds. I want to honor those owners who have decided to take chances and those whom I believe have made interesting changes or upgrades to their rosters. So without further ado, here are my five most intriguing team builds going into the new SFL season. Five. My number five most intriguing team build of the new season is the Tallahassee Pride. That mainly has to do with the fact owner Frank Gooden added last year's championship owner slash coach Thomas Paternetti to his coaching staff as offensive coordinator. T-Pat once again proved last season when he has the proper time to game plan, he can beat anyone. But Gooden didn't stop there. He also changed his offensive focal point from a gold running back to a gold quarterback. Plus, he added two silver wide receivers. Throw in a gold tight end and it appears T-Pat has been given all the tools to be successful on that side of the ball. The Pride's defense is still anchored by strong safety A.J. Barnes, but with only one silver defender and five bronze defenders, two of which are defensive linemen, Frank will have his hands full making sure his lower tier defenders are in the right place to make plays when he needs them. Four. My number four most intriguing team build on the season is the Baltimore Crabs. This is a Crabs team that went 8-4 and four last year, and was one offensive series away from the conference championship game, so don't sleep on them. What makes them my fourth most intriguing team build this season is the fact owner Tim Johnston has elected to implement the four wide receiver set in his offense this season. And for a team that always seems to be on the edge of winning or losing every game last year, this new offensive playstyle could be the exact thing that pushes them over the edge. Baltimore has decided to hand Silver Star quarterback Andrew Rastelli the keys to this overcharged offense along with a gold, silver, and two bronze wide receivers. But the Crabs will also have the ability to run the ball as they continue to invest in a gold running back. On defense, familiar names like Eddie Gage, Deshaun Miller, and Jeffrey Dezer return to wreak havoc in the secondary. So expect their defense to be as tough as ever. Three. My number three most intriguing team build, team build of the new season is the St. Louis Gladiators. With other SFL teams, excuse me, while other SFL teams are tiptoeing into the defensive line pool, St. Louis is cliff diving. With a gold defensive tackle and two silver defensive ends, 
the Gladiators will be the standard bearers when it comes to pass rush this season. And I believe it's a bit of an all-or-nothing gamble. Although they have offensive weapons in a gold quarterback and a silver wide receiver to put points on the board, they must ultimately stop teams from scoring to win. In my opinion, with no star linebackers or strong safety, their defensive game plan has to be all about placing pressure on the quarterback. It will be a battle of the trenches to determine their games. It's a gamble I'm excited to watch just to see if it pays off on a weekly basis. Two. My number two most intriguing team build of the new season is the Queen City Corsairs. This is typical of the three-time SFL champions. They win a chip, then they take the season off for the rest of us to have a chance. Then they win another chip. It's a vicious cycle. But if the best indicator of future performance is the past, then the Corsairs should be the favorites to win it all this season. And with teams like Minneapolis, Louisville, and D.C. all gone, Queen City could easily rise to the top and quickly. But, look at, but, but looking at their team bill, the Corsairs have opted, just like St. Louis, to invest heavily along their defensive line. With a gold defensive end, a bronze defensive end, and a bronze defensive tackle. Prominently missing from the roster, though, are star cornerbacks. They have non-stars in that role, something I don't believe that has ever been done in the SFL to date, and I applaud them for it. The Corsairs have opted instead to devote three silvers to their defense, a strong safety and two linebackers. Offensively, they have all the tools to be successful, a gold quarterback, running back, a silver wide receiver, and two bronze wide receivers. My biggest question is how will these non-star cornerbacks handle some of the best wide receivers in the league? That should be fun to watch. One. Finally, my most intriguing team build of the new season goes to the Sioux Falls Sparrows. Owner Jason McGee has known nothing but success in the SFL regular season. Could his newest, most interesting, and some would say risky build be what finds him postseason success as well, is the question. Despite having prominent running backs in the past, the Sparrows have decided on a non-star in the backfield. Gold quarterback Julian Tyree still has his favorite target in gold wide receiver Jordan Jennings. The team also signed championship Mahler silver receiver Jalen Miller. But outside of those three offensive players, every other star position on the defense is on the defensive side of the ball. That's just amazing. And I have, I have so many questions about this build. I, I hope to have an interview with Mr. McGee up soon to answer some of them, so stay tuned. But... Some of those inquiries will only or only can be answered on the field. Questions like, can you get viable production from a non-star running back? Does Tyree have enough tools to produce an effective offense? And how will teams deal with a defense that features nine, count them, nine star players? For my money, the Sioux Falls Sparrows are the most intriguing team this season. And when they are on, it's must-watch TV. Well, I hope you enjoyed my list. What teams are you interested in watching this season? Leave your answers in the comments section below or hit me up on Slack at roughneck-owner-media. Now it's time for my one-on-one -on -one interview with Carolina Skyhawks owner James Klein. Enjoy. It's a pleasure for me to have uh, on the line with me right now, Mr. James Klein, the owner of the Carolina Skyhawks. How you doing, James? I'm doing great. Just sitting here watching a little playoff football. <laughs> um... You know, thinking back to last season, your Carolina Skyhawks, they, they struggled at times. And, and and what did you like the most out of what you saw out of your team last season? What did you dislike the most, just thinking back on last year? Well, I think I think everybody, you know, I, it was a down year for our second season. Our first season, I felt, was really successful. But, uh, you know, the guys got frustrated when things didn't go our way. But I knew... I knew that we was going to be on the downside because of the strategy of taking uh, user players and having limited abilities would hurt us. Uh, but pretty much the team stayed together. I think more, you know, you, you asked the question during the season. I think it was more after we was eliminated, everybody bonded together and we're trying to fix some things to be, you know, a contender. So I would say the the team part is what really stuck with me. What I didn't like is my uh, 
decision to weigh myself completely on defense and and to limit our passing game. And, that, you know, I put all that on me. Uh, I was the one that put the team together. And, uh, you know, that's pretty much, you know, my blame. So I, I guess that's the two – Two questions you wanted answered. Well, yeah, and you know, uh, you were definitely heavily committed last year on the defensive side of the ball. You had two gold cornerbacks. Uh, I personally, I thought it was a bold move. I really appreciated. Uh, I really appreciate bold moves in this league, and and I thought you were taking a, a bold choice, and especially the way that our league last year was dominated so much by the passing game. It seemed like you guys had the ultimate answer to that with two gold cornerbacks, but it just didn't ever seem to come together the way that you wanted it to. Uh, but this offseason, you know, it seems like you guys went for a more balanced approach. What was your philosophy going into your, your team build here this in this new season? I seen how much we couldn't – we just couldn't throw the ball. You know, a lot of people put the blame on our quarterback, but to be honest uh, – you know, I just didn't give him the tools to to do a lot with, and I realized that. Um, in my opinion, we probably got the all-time greatest uh, halfback in the league, and uh, so he had to get a lot of carries. Um, you know, hopefully he won't have to carry the ball as much, but still he's going to be a threat even if we have him out there not getting the ball or if he is getting the ball. He's always going to be a threat. So we just wanted to be more balanced. Um, the thing is, is I, I've put the the bad part is I've put Shan Varner in a very bad situation where he was over the offense, had limited players, and I moved him to defense with very you know with a lot less talent than what Andy had. And uh, you know I know you're gonna ask that question about that, but <laughs> yeah. but but you know I, I it it was mainly to make us good on both sides of the ball well that leads me right to my question you know this offseason you decided to swap your offensive and defensive coordinators which is really unusual move what was the what was the thought process behind that it's more for them to because they both want to be uh, owners and I talked to both Andy and Shan and we you know for them to be successful when they do move on to their own teams, it gives them the tools to be very successful if they know both sides of the ball. And that was the main reason that we did that. Uh, we had some other things that was coming in play because, you know, we really thought maybe Andy was going to get a team. Uh, I wanted Chan uh, to be really the, the leader of the coaching staff that was in place. I was fortunate enough to keep Andy. But after talking and having a couple of Skype meetings, we decided that, you know, for them to be better coaches in the long runs, it, w it would make more sense for them to switch sides. And we'll see how that turns out. But that's, that's really the only reason we did that. Well, speaking of those Skype meetings, you know, Carolina is known for being one of the most interactive teams in the SFL from coaches to your user star players to non-stars. You guys seem to do a really great job of keeping everyone active and involved throughout the season, even if it's on a, in a on a downturn. You guys still seem to have that interactivity and in that involvement. How do you do that? How, how did you? How have you done so? And what advice could you give to maybe some of the other owners who who struggle in that area? Well, as far as that goes, I I really put that on Andy and Shane because. They're both, in my opinion, very, uh, I would say, sociable people. Uh, that's just their personalities. Now, I've managed businesses and I actually coach football. And the hardest thing to do is to, to manage or coach personalities. And um, both of those guys are not shy. Um, they both have personalities that they can talk to anybody. So my suggestion is if you're going to put somebody on your coaching staff, make sure that they can communicate with people. Now, I don't get on there like they do and communicate, but when I first started talking to them, too, I knew right away that they would be very coachable. And, uh, you know, they just, just really have took off with it. And, and uh, we have the belief if 
if we can get more people involved, not only is it going to help the team stand out more on Slack and and on the internet, but also it keeps us motivated. And also, I mean, we was motivated when we was put out of the playoffs because of that. Right. But uh, but also it gives us the possibility of uh, training other people to be coaches. And right now we've got two or three guys that's that stepped up and are helping out a lot with with the team and and uh, not only with scouting, they're helping with the playbook. So you know, if 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 and when they lead, you know, these guys will fit right in uh, unless they take them with them. So, but, but pretty much it's just their, them two's personalities. It's, it's nothing really that I've done. I just make sure that we're always positive and, and Andy and Shan will both tell you there's been negative comments in our team room before, but I've always, you know, a, a person that's managed a business and, and actually coach, you know, negativity is not good. So we're always trying to be positive even when we're not, when we shouldn't be, but, but that, that's, it's them too. You, uh, we, we talked a little bit before we started the interview and you were telling me that you have four children, that you coach football, that you get, you've got, you're, you're even taking some classes in college there. Um, mm-hmm. so I, I take it just from, from, from that. And then extrapolating what you've said just now about that, uh, some of the things maybe some other owners could do is just find some good help. Yep. Yeah. I, if, if it wasn't for Shannon and Andy, uh, I'll be honest with you, you know, we wouldn't have the people we have on board. Uh, I think, you know, I think we'd, I'd still could put out a good product, but I wouldn't put out a great product. And that's, and it's all based on them too. And, you know, I got a couple other guys with like Maurice, he's very involved and, and, uh, you, you know, us four are the nucleus of the Skyhawks. We all four came together. So, you know, that's, that's pretty much what's going on because uh and chan and andy both can tell you from about i don't know about may last week of may till november you know i'm i'm doing the real thing and it, it's <laughs> it's a uh, almost a 40 hour a week job on top to top of uh being a, a school teacher so wow. but but you know i like i said the, the success we have has to be on my staff it has really nothing to do with me Let's talk back a little bit back uh, more about uh, SFL football as far as on the field. You you commit a, the largest portion of your salary cap uh, this season, I believe, once again to running back Johnny English. With mm-hmm. this rebalancing of the team build, do you still consider English the focal point of the offense? And would it be a major disappointment if he didn't lead the league in rushing since you've invested so much in him? Well, I'll be honest with you. I'm going to go back – to a kid I actually coach, and, and uh, he's, he led uh, the state of North Carolina in rushing. Uh, he's 11th in the nation. Uh, but everybody, you know, in the uh, local papers and, and people I talk to, they say, they talk about my running back. Well, it starts up front, and, you know, we have a really good offensive line at the high school I uh, teach at. And uh, what reason why I'm saying that is English is the highest play, played guy or paid guy. But, you know, having people around him is what's going to make him better. The first year I had him, I had two really good wide receivers. And, uh, and well, one used to be a tight end. We moved him to receiver. But, you know, we could get them the ball at any time. And it, he – had a really good season that first year I, he was with me last year was a little bit down year because everybody stacked a box on us and knew what was doing so you know going in this year sure he's getting paid a lot but i've put more uh weapons around him with guys that are second year or second season players that have more abilities and um plus we're we're getting pretty good at at this playbook we've got some things up our sleeve that uh you know hopefully will help us so um you know i still like to say that johnny english is the best player in the game but you know there's you you guys will be surprised what happens your first contest uh this year has been selected as the game of the week 
Can you tell us a little bit about your previous matchup with Sioux Falls <laughs> and what you expect to see from them on Monday night? I expect them to do pretty much what they did last year. And, um, you know, hopefully we can have success like we did last season. Um, you know, honestly, their, their, their owner and coaches I have a lot of respect for, um, uh, I feel that he, you know, he, uh, he'll be prepared and, you know, we, we'll just try to do our best against him, but, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be looking at him to, to throw the ball. I'll just be honest with you. Uh, Jason does a good job, but, you know, maybe he'll surprise me, but I think that's what he'll do. And he, he, I think he knows what we'll do. Uh, finally, outside of Sioux Falls, is there any particular matchup that you are looking forward to this season? Well, I don't like facing you, for one thing. You've had really good luck against <laughs> me. But uh, but my buddy from up in Pennsylvania there, uh, Doug Bose, I've never got to play him head-to-head as a – is an owner. He's on the schedule, and and Doug's Doug's a wonderful guy, and got to know him really well. And, and I've got relatives right near him, and hopefully one day I get to go visit him. But uh, um, that's probably the game I look forward to the most. Now, you know, with the Baltimore Crabs playing them twice this year, you know that's going to be a battle. Um, and probably if if there if there's a rivalry, that's it right there. Is it? You know, everybody knows it. So, but I would say Doug, because I haven't got to face him. Well, James, I, I want to thank you for taking the time here on the SOB podcast, and uh, I want to wish you and the Carolina Skyhawks all the best of luck this season. And, uh, you know, thank you for, for talking to us and being such a gentleman and uh, and, and making this league a, a, a better place to, to be, to, to, uh, to hang out, to be a part of. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. And one, one thing, Stephen. Uh, yeah. Um, at the end of the day, we're all in this together. I mean, you know, sometimes I've seen things happen on Slack that, you know, you wake up in the morning, you read what somebody has said, and, you know, and, you know, I, my team's have been in the center of controversy ever a certain individual, but, you know, at the end of the day, we've got to realize it's just, uh, this is for fun. Um, we're all... A whole lot of us, a lot of us are a whole lot alike. So, you know, it's it's just, you know, at the end of the day, let's just remember it's all fun and uh, and I just enjoy the company. I think Cam is very talented uh, with his uh, play calling. I expect to see him on TV one day. So, it's just it's just fun to be involved with it. All right, that's James Klein, owner of the Carolina Skyhawks. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Again, I'd like to thank James for taking the time to speak with us. I wish him and his amazing coaching staff and players all the best in the upcoming season. Now it's time to end the show with the segment we call The Postscript. P.S. As NFL football begins to wind down, it's the perfect time for the SFL to pick up. And it's obviously by design. For those that crave football on a weekly basis and whose NFL teams are no longer in contention, this is the perfect time to introduce them to the SFL. With our user participation at an all-time high, the introduction of the SFL Red Zone and Fantasy Football, there is no better time than now to get your football friends and family involved. I know for me it's difficult to try and get my football-loving friends and family interested on, on what on the surface appears to be a video game. But it seems once those types of individuals put their preconceived ideas aside about what a video game is and see the SFL for what it actually is, football, things start to change. Encourage your football-loving friends, family, and fellow fantasy football players to give the SFL a chance. Set up the SFL Red Zone on the big screen in the living room and invite people over to watch the big game or, or tell those fantasy football lovers that they can still get their football fix over here at the SFL and it's free with prizes. The SFL Brass and a great number of individuals have worked so very hard to make this the most interactive and accessible season ever. Now the onus is on us, those that enjoy the fruits of all their hard work, to spread the good news. And what is the good news? That football doesn't have to end when the NFL ends. In fact, 
The SFL is just beginning. Enjoy it. Thank you, my friends, for listening. As always, I love hearing your feedback about the show. Thanks, thanks to all the people who contacted me after the first SOB podcast. Your words of encouragement inspired me to produce this podcast. If you enjoy, if you enjoyed this show, please let me know. Your words are the fuel for my creative engine. And if you'd like me to feature something on the show or just have some ideas on how to improve it, just hit me up on Slack at roughnecks-owner-media. Finally, this show doesn't happen without you, the listeners. Without you, it's just a lonely man alone with the microphone. Until next time, take care. Nice work, everyone. Sharp broadcast. Really good. Everyone on the floor as well. Really a lot of hustle. I liked it.